Hi there, my name is Arun. Today we'll be talking about testing JavaScript using QUnit. That's my Twitter handle, nmarun53, and that's my weblogs.asp.net slash nmarun is my blog link. So we'll go over the agenda, um, a quick introduction of QUnit, we'll and then we'll write a very simple uh, test using QUnit. And then we'll see what a QUnit test runner is and what capabilities it's providing us. We'll do some code coverage with, um, with some blanket JS um, library. And then we'll do some DOM tests. And these are simple tests. We don't want to do some, we, I'm, I'm not going to do any, any big, major, crazy kind of test. And then we are going to see how we can use mock JAX to mock our AJAX calls. This is especially useful for doing all your unit tests. And finally, we will see what Grunt is and how we can set it up and, and run automated tests using Grunt. Right? So, QUnit is um, very lightweight. I mean, I didn't find anything um, slowness or anything like that. It's a very lightweight, easy to use JavaScript unit testing framework. It's, it's, a, it's capable of testing any generic JavaScript code, nothing specific to any, any of the available uh, frameworks like Angular or Ember or Backbone, whatever it is. So it's not specific for any for any of those. You can just write tests for unit tests for JavaScript code. That's all it is. It's actually quite popular. Um, jQuery, jQuery UI, jQuery mobile are all using QUnit. Uh, there are just three files, right? The CSS file, the QUnit.css, the QUnit.js which are both provided by QUnit site. And then the site qunitjs.com provides us with a snippet of what the HTML should look like. Right? That, that'll be our test runner, we'll be running that. Turns out it's kind of a popular choice. It's, it's um, because of its ease of use, I think that that is the reason why it's quite popular. And you can also do some DOM testing. Right? So you provided your DOM is kind of simple and it doesn't require too many uh, user interactions or whatnot. And it does not depend on jQuery. So it's written using typical jQuery or, or the plain old JavaScript, JavaScript. But if it works really well with JavaScript, you know, it doesn't have any issues and we'll see that it doesn't have any issues if you have jQuery along with your test. So that is a simple unit test that we are, we are going to see. I have a module there. The so module gives you a bucket and a bucket for or a container maybe for related tests. Okay, so the first, the next line says test. So that's where I'm saying I'm giving it a name, basic test. Usually you will have a name, something that says test should pass uh, a negative number or test should, you know, give something like that. Test should do something kind of a thing. You'll have a very descriptive name there. I've just given a generic name. Followed by that is followed by. Uh, a function and that is your actual function that is your javascript function so i have two variables declared here one is called as actual so it's kind of simulating a value from your javascript method your service call your your um, your actual test method whatever it is right so that is the simulation value of that and then i'm expecting the expected value is one so that's what i'm setting expectations with and then we have two asserts there okay which takes an expression. So if the expression evaluates to true or JavaScript truthy, it gives me a value. It says it passed that assert. And then the second one is equal where I pass in an actual and expected values as parameters. And then if they are true, if they are, if they again evaluate to truthy, they'll give me their equal. They'll tell me that they're equal. So the first in, in the first, in both cases, I'm passing a string and comparing it with an integer. So since both of them are not, so I'm not doing equals 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 here, which checks for, which is a strict equals, so which checks for the data type as well, I'm not doing that. So in this case, in this simple test, both of them should come back as true for me. Let's just see a code. So I have my main tests here. Right? I have the exact same test pass here. I'm going to run my queue unit, which is, I'll just go over the, HTML. This is kind of the snippet HTML that QUnitJS.com provides. So you you provide your CSS, the QUnit CSS. 
and then you, you you tell what version of jQuery you require. And again, this is optional. If you don't require jQuery for your unit test, you don't need to mention that. And then you have your JS mentioned here, right? The QUnit JS. The last two are my main.js, that's where the code is. And then this is my main test.js. This is where I'm rewriting all my tests. Right, so that is the test. And I have my QUnit HTML here. I'm going to run that. And then there, okay, all my tests are passing. Well, it's not all, just one half, right? So if my tests are passing and I click on that, it says both my asserts have passed, you know, the green there. So it says truthy and they're equal, right? So it says zero, two comma two, zero. The first one is kind of reddish color. The next one is kind of greenish. So those are failed, passed, and those are the number of asserts in your test, right? It gives some basic summary here. Okay, going back, let's see what the test runner page gives us, the, the options that are there in the test runner page. Right. So the first one, it says high pass test. So if you want to see only failing tests and you don't want a big list of things, you can just say high pass test. Then check for globals. Anytime you're writing JavaScript code, any code, not just your unit testing, even, even your code, the production code, you want to make sure that all your variables are declared within a specific scope. You're not leaving dangling variables outside, right? So anytime you you put, um, say, say something like actual equals to, and the actual is not defined within your function or within your JavaScript file, it gets associated with your global, it make, becomes a global property, right? So it's polluting the global environment is, is basically what is happening. So, you always want to make sure that all your code is local and all the variables are local. So you give in a test runner allows us to check for those globals. If you are adding or modifying any global properties, then it will fail the test. We'll see that. We'll see an example of that. And then the note, note try cat says, well, is there, um, if you have code that runs inside a try catch, it says remove that try catch and then run my test. That way, if you're having some weird exception that is getting caught in between and is not being um, thrown or bubbled up to the user to see what exactly is failing, you can try this option. Although this, try, this option is kind of a um, kind of a very specific scenario, but at times when you're stuck and you don't know where to go, you can try that option. You can run individual tests or specific modules. We'll see that. And then we, it gives us a summary of the test. So it says, it has completed in so many seconds and in my previous case, in my previous test, I had one assertion and one of them passed and here. So I've modified that test now. So our simple test, basic test has two assertions and both of them are passing and, and that's what the summary is telling here, right? So let's try this. Let's, let, let me just go and do hide pass test. So there it'll only show failing tests in which case, in, this, in my case, I don't have any right now. And then I can do check for globals. So again, my test is passing, but I can make this fail right now by just doing that. So I've created a, a variable called actual, but I've not actually put the var in there. So I'm not giving it a scope. So that actual becomes a global property now. So with that property, with the check for globals option checked, if I run my test, it's failing my test saying, hey, you have introduced a new global variable called actual, which is a big no, no. So you always, always, always want to create your variables in the local scope right and this is not just true for your your code it, i mean it, for your test code it's also true for your code right so you don't want to add variables local variables to your global code right? and the third one was try no catch again in my case that, that will not be happening i don't have any try catch so my tests are passing fine so you are seeing for every of these options you are seeing a query string parameter getting added here Right, so this one, the third one is just um, hide or show kind of a thing, right? That is what QUnit provides us. And then if you see the HTML, it doesn't have all of those bells and whistles. It just has place old placeholders for them, right? So the toolbar, the user agent information and the unit tests result, right? That's, that's where all of those are getting shown. Ignore the comments for now. We'll, we'll go over the comments later on. Moving on, right? So these are the asserts that we have. 
we have okay we we saw the usage of this one so yeah, okay expects an expression if it evaluates to javascript truthy then it says i'm passed right so an empty string oh, sorry a non empty string is also it also evaluates to truthy so even the second okay in, in the example here even that will pass right equal is a non strict assertion assertion so a string versus a data type will be equal if their value is equal strict is you know, something that checks for the data type as well so you have to pass in an integer and it has to be uh, of the same value so deep equal recursively checks for um, array elements right that an array it runs through a collection or if you have an object if you are comparing objects it checks for checks for their properties as well and again in in deep equal is a strict equal right so it, you know, the usage of that one is items and items one so it's actual expected and then if all of them are same then yes the, the this assertion will pass if you have um if you have for some particular except for some particular reason or some specific condition you are saying if this condition is true then throw an exception in your javascript code you can test that with the throws assertion right so you can simulate that scenario and say that should throw back an exception and then you have not equal not strict equal not deep equal to come to you know there there are complements for equal strict equal and deep equal now let's look at the system error test the actual um, code that i've written and then we'll start writing tests for them so let's look at what my application is doing i'm going to my index page so kind of a simple simple page i have two input arguments here two text fields and then i have two buttons right one of them says show some from client the other says so show some from the server so when i click on the first button it makes uh, it it calls your javascript function to make a summation of two numbers the numbers that i've entered here i'm not doing any kind of error validation or error check here so it checks for you know, the summation it does the summation on the client side the javascript does the summation and then returns the value and puts the return value here and the second one it goes to the server i'll show you the mvc application it goes to the server it makes the add and then returns back the value so let's look at what my controller is doing you can use anything for your for your value for your server side code so what mine is doing is i have a home controller and an index action method i'm just saying a string of arg1 and arg2 because that's what i'll be reading them and then i'll try to parse them if both of them succeed then i will return a summation of the two input parameters if not if there's something wrong then i'll just say hey you got give me an invalid output input okay so that is my value let's see the the application we are trying to use let's see that works so i have two and five i say show some from client and i'm going to open the network tab okay and i'm going to say show some from server and then it makes a call to my application and then that is the arguments that i've passed you know i don't know if you guys can see this but it says um arc1 equals 2 and percent arc2 equals 5 so server says the sum of 2 and 5 is 7 right now let's look at the code to begin with i am document ready i'm just saying wire up a couple of events right so when the user clicks on button 1 you call get some text read the values that are that the user has entered in the two text boxes and then the get some text will actually internally call the get some which will parse those um, strings and then return their <coughs> sum right so and then the output is client says sum of arc1 and arc2 is some value and then the second button is saying get some some text from the server so here i'll be doing an ajax call and i'm passing those that is my url i'm building the url and once it is done right once i got back the response my summation value will be in the xhr it's just the xhr i'm not returning any object or anything that's when i get the summation of you know from the server that the server says sum of arg1 and arg2 is the xhr value and i write it to the output window right here i'm doing the same thing that's the reason why you are seeing both the outputs in the same window now let's go ahead and write one simple test so for that i'm going to comment this guy out and then i'm going to uncomment my first test 
right? So let's see what that is doing. So it's a module called sum test. I have another module later on. And then this is what I was talking earlier. Your, your test name should be more descriptive. So it says test should add correctly. So I'm passing an extra parameter here. We'll see what that extra parameter is in the next slide. And then you have your test function, right? So there I'm saying get sum. This is the JavaScript method that we wrote in my main JS. So that is what I'll be writing test for now. Right? So I'm saying get sum, pass string values for two and one, and then do a strict equals for the expect the actual value, and that should be the value that is the expected value. And then if that is the case, then it says sum is correct. I've saved all my changes. Now let's go back and I will do a refresh. Okay, okay. So my sum tests have passed correctly. So I've got the message saying sum is correct, right? So there, that is how simple it was to write for a test for the get sum method. Okay. <clears throat> now, you be the the extra parameter that we saw there, right? The, I was talking about the the extra parameter that we saw there. It's a good practice to mention at the top of each test how many asserts you're going to expect, you're expecting in this particular test module. Right? When you go to complex things like async test or if you start doing um, more async stuff like you know set timeouts, or if your function has set timeouts, then you want to have, you want to make sure that all of your expects are actually run. Right? So that's a good good practice. So you want to you want to mention that okay this is this test is expecting one assert to run before it exits, and if that count mismatches, so if there are two of them and I'm saying one or the other way around, it throws an exception and it actually fails the test. Right? The shortcut this is the this is the verbose method of mentioning it. This is kind of the shortcut method of mentioning it. That's what I had in my test. Right? So. That's the reason I, the title is, and the title of the slide is expect. It's a good practice, right? So what about um, async and timer functions, right? So anything, anything async. I, we look at we look at this test here. So when you run that test, I have a test called asyncness test. And one second later, and I'm passing and saying I have one assert. I'm expecting one assert, and my my test function says set timeout for one second. And after one second, execute that function, right? So in that function, I'm just doing one, okay, I'm just doing one assert. And obviously, it values to true. So if this function runs in a timely manner, my test will pass. But the problem is that set timeout will not wait. It just, it's, it's like, you know, it just says, okay, I have a function to run after one second. And it just fires that and says, okay, I'm done. I, my work is done, so I'm getting out of this. So the test starts with the test starts with saying, okay, set timeout. It executes that function and then it gets out. So you'll get two exceptions here. First one is that says that hey, why I expected one assert but zero were run, right? Because this was never executed. And the second thing is after one second, your set timeout does get executed. That function does get called, and then your OK is getting called. And then it says, hey, you try to run an, an assertion outside the test context because the test method has ex had exited by the time this function was run. So you, you're seeing you're seeing the issues here, right? So if I do if I do test, I cannot do async calls because by default, when you say test, it just starts executing the test. Right, so you're seeing the issue with calling test because test by default starts executing your code. So what's the solution for that? Solution is to use something called as an async test, right? Async test, the benefit of using async test is that async test does not start doing the test. So until you actually tell it to start running the test. So we are seeing what unit async test is doing here, right? So the solution, as I said, is to run something called as an async test. So async test does not start by default unless you explicitly do a start, 
okay so you can run async test inside your test functions so the first line in your test would be to say stop and then somewhere in the middle of the code you say start but then you don't want to do the starts the stop start thing every time instead you just start using the async test right which has the inbuilt feature of not starting a test the moment the function is getting executed so what happens here is there is a set timeout for the same thing this exact same setup here so there is a set timeout with the function which waits for one second so after a second it executes that function and after that after the okay is executed that's when you're doing a start right the benefit here is your control has not exited from this async test method it waits till your start is being called and then it says okay i'm expecting one assert i got one assert it's true so i'm green so now it's time to get out right and that's why if you see the time here it says a thousand one thousand fifty one milliseconds and then it says one assertion of one passed right so that is how you do async test right so we can do some code coverage using um, this this library called blanket js it's, it's really useful it's really powerful and it's extremely extremely simple so all you do is download that version so when i took the screenshot of this the uh, version was 1.1.115 1.1.5 so what i did was i just took this is how you set up blanket js right so there is one js file to reference you need to add a property called a data cover data cover on every js file that you want coverage on this is not for the test file this is for your code file right it's for every file that you want coverage on you do data hyphen cover and after that there the there is one gotcha that says that your blanket js reference should be the last reference in your page and that's it that you do that and you're done okay let's see that working now let's make that happen so i'm going to uncomment this line here that says blanket js the reference for that and i have the last one here and the other thing i have to do is to say data cover on my main.js right and i already made sure that j blanket main or blanket js is my is the last reference in my file right now if i go back and run my test so see you have three options now right so when i go back and run my test come on right i'm getting a fourth one enable code coverage right so i just do a, i just check that look at that i'm getting this entire piece of code at the bottom right this is my this is the working of your blanket js right so what it says is 9 out of 19 are covered which is a 40 47ish percent and the coolest part is this right so i click on the the file that i'm i'm asking to be covered and it gives me the lines that are not covered so all of these lines it says are not covered right so now I know what I need to write my tests on. Cool. I'll just leave that on for now. Right. So we saw a code coverage of around 47%. Right. It, it, you just saw how simple it was, right? You just you just add a few lines of code and you're not even polluting or adding stuff to your main script file, your main code file. And then it's not like, you know, I added this piece of information and I accidentally checked it in. Nothing like that. You're just adding all of the stuff to your QUnit HTML file. Okay. Right. So that is the result that we saw. Now we'll write one more unit test. We'll enable one more unit test on my code and we'll see what happens. So that is my, that is the second test I'm going to enable. So it says test should display the text correctly. So when I click on the, um, you know, the first button, it says get the sum from the client. So I'm calling the get sum text and passing two um, string numbers, in, numbers in string format. And then I'm saying the sum text value that is returned by the get sum text should equal client says colon, the sum of three and five is eight, right? So that is what it should say. Let's see what happens when I run the test. I have the code coverage enabled and look at that my set two tests have passed and then my code coverage has improved has increased and then there, there is one thing you might be seeing here it's it's showing these numbers in red right 
So now it's it's saying that that test is also covered. The only only thing remaining for me is to test those the on ready, and I also have to test the AJAX function, right? As I said, they are showing in in red because um, Q unit has kind of a, a number, a magic number, seventy percent. You can change that later on. So it has seventy percent. If you get seventy percent or more coverage on your test, it'll show it'll show them in green, right? So again, another visual indicator that you need to write more tests. All right. So our DOM tests. What about DOM tests? Is DOM testing possible? Yes, it's possible. What you do is you do you inject or you write your DOM code onto your HTML page. You can either do it dynamically or you do it statically, however you want to do it. But you can do it um, <clears throat> when I say dynamically as part of your test. You just inject some some DOM onto your page to a specific node. You can create a specific node for that and then inject your DOM onto it and then do some testing. Or on the other hand, what you can do is you can have static text. If it is a simple DOM, you can have static text and then say, you know what, now that I have, now that I have a static test, I can do all the client side stuff, the, the DOM um, validation, right? You can start testing your DOM. So I have the exact same setup here. So I have two text fields that have that have arg1 and arg2 as IDs. I have the div as output one. This is where you'll start seeing the output. And then I have the same two buttons, button one and button two. So when this page loads, what happens is let me just go back to the code. So let me let me enable this. Right? So I'm going to enable this stuff. Right now I have the exact same things on on the on the page. And then as soon as this page loads, it says okay, there is something called as button one and button two, and they will get these events registered. Right. So those those elements will get the click events registered. So they are now testable through my to my test case. Right. So I'm going to enable the first DOM test here. So I've created another, another module for that. As a test should add correctly on the client side. Right. So this is the DOM test I'll be doing. So there I'm val I'm adding values to my text fields. Right. I'm adding two and five. And then I'm I'm manually triggering the click event on button one. So they're registered, right? Now that they are on the page, once the page loads, these are registered, okay? So they're registered. So when I do a click, it's a client side thing. So the output should be, should have some value. And then I can say equal output of client says the sum of two and uh, two and five is sum seven, right? Let's, let's see this test. Now you can also see my code coverage go up once we run this test. There you go, now it's 73%. <clears throat> and then you got the sum text is correct. So the, the third test is passing. And as I said, the 70% cut off the threshold for 70%. Now it's passed. So now my code coverage is results are showing in green, which means I've, I've done enough. But let's not stop here. Let's keep continuing. Okay. That was my first DOM test. We injected those values in there and then we got the output. How about Ajax call? Right now, the next one, then the the next test that we have to do is for Ajax calls. Now, you don't want to be running Ajax calls in your your unit test. You'll be breaking the unit the tenets of unit testing. Right, unit testing should not talk to any other components. They should be just be having mock versions of those components. So no network calls, no DB DB reads and writes and stuff like that. Right. So, in order to do Ajax call or in order, to, in order to mock your Ajax calls, you use the jQuery mock Jax library. Right? So that's the GitHub link for that. What it does is it inter intercepts your Ajax calls and then returns a preset response. Right? That The preset response is what you're going to define. So you'll see that there won't be any, there are no server side calls, so you won't see any trace in Fiddler. It uses, you can, you can enable wildcards in there, so it works only on the mock that you've specified. So it is, you can use wildcards. We'll see the example of that below. So I'm saying here, mock jacks, if you get an URL of home slash home star, return the response text of seven. So no matter what the your, your URL arguments are, the query string parameters, it will return a text of seven in the JSON format. I mean, in this case, there's no JSON format per se, but if you had, you can set up the data type as well. Right? 
So let's do some tests. Let's enable our last test. Okay. I'll, I'll just step over this one. So the first line I say mock checks clear. So what I'm telling here is if you had any previous mock check settings, just clear them off. Right now, I'm going to give you specific um, mock values for this test. And then I'm saying clear out the text value as well for the output. And then here, I'm saying Ajax setup, make the async as false. So run your Ajax calls as a synchronous call. The benefit, the benefit here is that I can use one. The benefit is that one I can use test. And the second one is that I don't have to do any any um, any you know um, script magic in here. So I don't have to Im take this script and you know uh, I, if I had to run it the synchronous way, I had to or the asynchronous way, I had to take the script and then do a bunch of starts and stops in here. So you not avoid that. I'm just setting up the Ajax call to be a synchronous one right that, that's another way to mock your or tell your ajax to do synchronous way so and then i'm saying mock jacks url of you know if you get an url of arg, arg, I mean, your arg1 equals 2 and arg2 equals 5 give back a response of 7 right so in the example we saw we saw the this whole thing replaced by a wildcard right in this case we are making that specific call so that's what it said. So if it is something specific, if it is, if you want a mock jax for general thing, you want to use wildcards, right? And then the data type is JSON. So now I'm going to set up my my input field. So I'm going to say arg arg one is two, arg two is five, and then I'm doing a button two of but click of button two. So because it's mock jax, it just gives back the value of seven almost instantaneously. There is no wait or latency or anything like that. And then I can I can then read the text of that and say server says the sum of two and five is seven. Right? That's the that's the value I'm missing. Right? Now that I've enabled this, I'm going to run my unit test and let's see what happens. Cool, my test is failing. So what's the reason? It says mock jax is not known. It doesn't know what mock jax is. That is right. That's because I did not enable the mock jax script on the page here. Right, so it, it it's kind of telling me that I did not enable the mock script. Now I'm going to remove the call, and now all my tests are running. Do another refresh. Okay, so my DOM test, both of my DOM tests are running, and I told earlier that you could run either individual test, right, or you could run individual modules, right. So I can run my sum tests, and then I can run my DOM tests. In this case, I want to run all the modules, right. So you have that flexibility as well. And now let's enable code coverage and see the results. And there you go, you have 100% code coverage now. If you click on your main, look at that, it also did the Ajax call. It, it says, okay, all of that, your, your register, click registers, they're all taken care of. They've all been tested, right? So that is how you do unit testing using QUnit. Now, Grunt. Grunt is a node package which use which you can use to automate your tests so you don't want to be doing if you're not comfortable doing it on the front on the page here on the on the browser here you can run it with your your command prompt right you can run it in command prompt and get the values the the benefit of this is this scripts can be integrated with these configurations can be integrated with your build scripts right so when you're when you're doing a build you can also now run your JavaScript tests, right? The unit test for for your JavaScript code. So let's see how the how to make that happen. So I've installed um, Grunt, right? As it's just a node package. So I've installed that, and then there is a config file that is required. This is in the in the root folder. So I have Grunt in its config, and then I say Q unit. Then for everything, just run that file. Right. So QUnit HTML is a file that we were running, and it runs that file and, and then reads the DOM values and get back, gets back the, um, you know, it, it takes the output and shows them shows it on your console. And the second test I'm doing here is for blanket blanket JS, and saying code coverage of true and the type of grunt report. So it wants a grunt report, 
and there you can also set a threshold of 80 percent so if it's if the code coverage is less than 80 percent then it will say false right it'll say it'll say that your test has failed i'm loading a couple of tasks here and i'm registering the queue unit and blanket queue unit packages right now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to say ls and grunt i'm sorry if you cannot see this this might be kind of a little too small for you so it's trying it's loading the page and then the first test it says four assertions have passed it took 72 milliseconds and then the second one it says okay um 80 percent four files oh sorry zero percent past code coverage now the reason is that on my on my queue unit file here i have to enable that basically saying that if you see a grunt report text in the href property then make sure that the reporter is of that type right so that's the reason why it was showing the pass of zero files pass code coverage now when i run my unit test again okay so there it says one files passed now it's it now that you see grunt package on the on the url so if we go back to the grunt file so i have the grunt report here which says that give me grunt style report right? and that's why it is telling me that one file passed code coverage okay that is how you do your automated testing using grunt right? now the references and the resources that will help you to write unit tests are the q unit to cookbook this is quite verbose very detailed you can get a lot of information here the benelman.com article was also very good you know it's kind of unique you have to use your left and right keys to move over it's like slideshow right you can use phantom js as your test as your um, test runner right give you a test runner instead of running them on the server you can then you can have a phantom you can use phantom js as your server now grunt js obviously has everything you want to know about grunt Test driven JS is a site that has up to date information about the benefits of testing. They, they, they just go down and on. It's an awesome, awesome site. And then I have a couple of plural site courses. If you have membership, plural site rocks. If not, try and get a membership for plural site. Uh, testing JavaScript. This is, a, this is a course on how do you, how you can write um, tests you on your client side, right? Client side test. And it has a bunch of things. It talks about Mocha. It talks about Sinon. It talks about spies and a lot of things. It also talks about how to set up karma and stuff like that, right? And then there is another course, Java jQuery Advanced, um, another amazing course on Plural Site, which will help you to write unit tests for your for your JavaScript code. Right? So guys, that is my session. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, just post it on the blog or tweet me, and I'll see if I can answer. I'll, I'll try to answer them at the earliest possible time. Thank you so much and I hope this one helped for you.